So here we are, Kirsten Stewart, on the wish list for Every Conversation Counts. Thanks for making time to do this. Thanks for having me. And you know that title, Our Turn, I think is a powerful one because if we talk about technology in the digital age, how do you feel technology has served women well? Because a lot of your story is about overcoming adversity in a male-dominated world of executive leadership. It is about having a voice. You know, I think any, any way you can amplify a voice, I think the, the, the give and take with technology is there's a lot of concern and it's well warranted that uh, sometimes you know, women online, it's not always the best experience. Um, but when you see what can happen on the flip side and you see either movements that women start, um, uh, they, they use hashtag campaigns to really kind of express something that they're angry or upset or want to bring attention to and change in the world out there. Uh, or when you see how they can actually, as individuals, have a platform that you couldn't have before. There's no waiting for a press release. There's no um, waiting for a time on a, on a show. You actually, as individuals, have the right to kind of not just um, defend, but actually represent yourself in a way that's different than before. So I think technology, in terms of digital uh, social platforms like that, has been incredible. You've got a, a great uh, life hat trick analogy in the book when you talk about life uh, when you talk about love, kids, and career, mm -hmm. how can you, as a, as a successful businesswoman, how can you establish the idea of having kids and make that compatible with having a successful career? I think there's, a, you know, the question is always, can you have it all, right? Like there's always that, uh, can you can you be all things to all people at once? Whatever that family looks like, you could be single mom, you could be uh, mom with a great partner, you can be someone with parents that can help you out. Like it's the community that you build around you that makes it work. And you have to realize there is no such thing as work-life balance. There is no 50-50, uh, but there's, you can try to get work work-life flow, right? Like it's it's maybe your 90% work one day because you're on a business trip uh, and you're less reachable. Maybe you're 90% home because you need to be home for a parent or a child or you know something that's going on. So I think we have to learn to accept the ebbs and flows of life and try to figure out how we can accommodate that push, you know, maybe push the, the pedal to the metal on those days when you've got the space to do it and those years that you've got the time to do it uh, because you can be a little more selfish. And in those other years and, and, and days and times, understand that maybe things are, are going to have to slow down so that you can accommodate other aspects of life. But that's life. And it's, I think it's the same for women and men. It's not a w women's issue. It's a family issue. I think that's a great point. It's a family issue. But I also see the concern and stress on the female side because your book, Our Return, points to light that... Uh, the Catalyst study in 2014. Mm -hmm. All the CEOs across Canada, only 5% are female. Yeah. Why are we still facing that dilemma? You know, I think things move slowly and old habits die hard. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of debate, there's a lot of studies done. You know, the needle is not moving fast enough. That is true. That's what we see. That has, that has been you know, the concern, I think, of women and men who kind of look at gender balance, diversity balance as as slowly as that needle's moving. But what I'm seeing right now is this kind of, we're at this kind of epicenter. Like I really do feel, and you can sense through, you know, the research that's in the book, there's, the times are changing and we're, we're ready for this moment in which, look what just happened at our election. Um, I don't think anybody predicted that. Uh, there's, there are moments in time when we are looking at major shifts, and I think we're up for a major shift in leadership. How were you effectively able to have your voice heard in the boardroom, speak up and have it respected as a point of authority in a male-dominated uh, corporate world? It's not always easy. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes you do get talked over. You, you, know, you, you do have to figure out, given all of the advice that women get today about leaning in, sometimes it's important to think about what you say when you lean in, what you're contributing. And I think you can sit and, which I've done before, fume about the times when you've uh, been talked over, you've been ignored at the table, or worse, your idea has been taken by a guy two, two minutes later and rephrased re, re, uh, and suddenly it's the genius thing at the table when you just said that. Didn't I just say that? And women listening to this will completely understand what I just said. Uh, but we have to get past that now. I think there is a break in in what's happening in the habit that businesses are understanding you can't just do things the way you used to and they got to move fast and they got to pull their best people in and they need ideas and innovation from 
all different perspectives, women are an important part of that. So if a business is successful, it's going to draw on that. And I think that's our moment. We can lean in, but lean in and contribute something that really matters. And for businesses to be successful, you really need good leadership. And you've got a great line in the book saying you don't need to be the boss to be the leader. How do you differentiate between influence and control when you try to establish power and respect as a leader? I think it's. I, I, I think there's one above all. I think ultimately it is respect. It's respect that's both ways. It's earned. Those old notions of what a boss is and what power is is no longer the kind of old attributes of of power, influence, you know, respecting the boss, blind, you know, loyalty, that kind of a, a a relationship. I think there's now an understanding that bosses are effective when they're collaborative, when they listen well, when they are able to multitask and di do hold diverse opinions in their head at one time. Uh, and that's something that when we talk about it in our turn that I say, you know, women have been told for a very long time we do those things very well. So whether you're a woman or whether you're somebody who's kind of been left out because the, that was your skill set and maybe it was considered to be soft skills, maybe it wasn't considered to be, you know, the decisive, focused, driven person that um, people expected in the corner office. That's not what's resonating now. That's not what's successful in leadership. And so I think that's what's giving us this opportunity. And with that communication, especially with someone in your role of leadership with Twitter or whatever sphere you've worked in, what's the approach to, to build that authenticity and that sense of trust with the relationships all along the way? It's interesting. When I was um, uh, the, the head of the CBC, I, you know, had there were staff that were we were coast to coast to coast. There were five thousand people. I never got to see them all. They were literally in you know white horse across the country, uh, and yet you want this sense of community because you're all working, particularly in something like media, you're all working towards the same the same goal and the same values, and so. That's when I started my Twitter handle, was when I was in that job. And I would get feedback from people, you know, really far flung saying, okay, now I understand, you know, it, by, by representing your whole self and not just a, the corporate side or just that speak, people, I think, get a deeper understanding, a deeper insight into the reasons you may lead or make decisions that you've made. And that humanizing factor, I think, is incredibly important. It kind of brings us back to the day where, you know, we were in the corner shop and being able to work together and see the, see the same, you know, townsfolk every day. Like, that doesn't happen as much anymore, and yet here's this new kind of town square on something like Twitter where you actually do get to see the same folks and look at their lives in different ways. So I think that really does help. This is probably a tough question to answer. It's the final one. When you look at all of the conversations across the board, what do you consider be, to, to be the most important conversation of your life that's got you in this point today? Um, it's funny. I think the most important conversation that I ever had was um, was with some was, was with my first boss. Uh, she was a woman called Ismay Benny. It was my first business trip ever, and my first business trip ever was to Monte Carlo. And I remember um, ordering in bleary-eyed, jet lag state, uh, the breakfast for the next morning. After arriving at my hotel, I said yogurt and orange juice. And you know, the next morning came not some beautiful Monte Carlo-ish <laughs> breakfast, but literally a yogurt and an orange juice. And it cost, like 25 years ago, 30 something dollars. And I thought, this is my first move, and I just got fired. Like, I just spent, like, what? this is, like, crazy. What have I done? So I went in uh, to, to, the, to the event that we, were, that we were meeting at. This is, like, this convention where you sell programming. And uh, I said, Ismay, I'm so sorry. I'll pay for it. I'll... And she's like, you're here to work. You need to eat. Eat. <laughs> And what that taught me in that moment was, first of all, she trusted me that I didn't do something on purpose. She put me first as a boss. She actually said, I get what you're going through. You've, you've explained your position. Like she, she understood that in that moment, I was young, vulnerable, uh, first time on a business trip, and she took the pressure off. Uh, and, and I think I learned a lesson that day that you do sometimes need to give grace to others like it's that it's that moment of forgiveness that I just remind myself all the time when someone makes a mistake when someone you know does something inadvertently or things just don't go everybody's way 
you just got to take the pressure off and you you have to realize people are doing the best they can and whether that's work or life, I think that's an important thing to remember. And you know, it echoes the sentiment in your book. Once again, if you're not failing, you're not trying anything new. So our turn is a powerful one. Kirsten, thanks so much for Thank making time. Thank you so much. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Hey, it's Riaz. Thanks for watching. For more conversations, click on subscribe and check us out online at everyconversationcounts.com.